Don't get killed. Nor you, my friend. Oh, are we friends now? Of course we are. Won't that make her a great song? I hope to hear them sing it one day. Helping me to arrange this meeting wasn't exactly looking after yourself, was it? You put yourself at risk. It's good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Good evening, Macabros, and welcome to episode 16 of Game of Thrones Rewrite. Today's subject, the cutthroat with a heart of maybe not gold, but at least silver, brawn. Although I am currently writing this sentence while staring at a blank page, I am going to venture a guess that this is going to be the shortest and most non-thorough rewrite, simply for the reason that I think Bronn's arc is almost perfect in the show. That is, up until season 8. Show Bronn's arc is almost identical to his arc in the book, with him joining Catelyn Stark as she escorts her prisoner, Tyrion Lannister, to the Eyrie, fighting for Tyrion in his trial by combat, traveling with him back to King's Landing, becoming the de facto leader of the City Watch, and repelling the forces of Stannis Baratheon during the Battle of the Blackwater, for which he is later knighted, thus upping his clout throughout King's Landing, while still working as Tyrion's right-hand man. In both the book and the show, after Tyrion is imprisoned after the Purple Wedding, Bronn is summoned by Tyrion, who asks him to serve as his champion in his upcoming trial by combat. In the show, Tyrion has already demanded a trial by combat before he asks Bronn, whereas in the book, he asks Bronn to do so before he demands the trial by combat. But it's a minor detail that doesn't make all that much difference, because in both the book and the show, Cersei has arranged for Bronn to be wed to Lawless Stokeworth, as a sort of bribe to sway him from being Tyrion's champion and in both, Bronn refuses to fight for him. Now on paper, this may sound like Bronn just telling Tyrion to go fuck himself, but in both the book and in the show, it is made clear that Bronn's decision to not fight for Tyrion is one of pragmatism, as opposed to him just not caring. Though desperate and a little miffed, even Tyrion can't blame the dude for not sticking his neck out to such a reckless degree. However, I would say that Bronn's refusal to fight for Tyrion in the book works better than it does in the show, since in the book, we get insight into Tyrion's internal monologue, and though he does consider Bronn a quasi friend, he is also a bit more dismissive and in some cases glib towards him. This fits, since Book Tyrion isn't as sympathetic or straight up likable as Show Tyrion is. In the show, the chemistry between Peter Dinklage and Jerome Flynn is fantastic, and because of this, as well as the lack of Tyrion's inner monologue, the relationship between Tyrion and Bronn, while it is still technically in the context of an employer and employee, is far more amicable. And, again, though Tyrion is of course paying Bronn for his service, it seems evident that Bronn and Tyrion truly care for each other, and Bronn's service is not just about the money. Keep that in mind, as it will be the basis of my contention with Bronn's treatment in Season 8. So Bronn refuses to fight as Tyrion's champion, which is chill, since Oberyn offers to do it, until, of course, My eyes! Tyrion is then condemned to death, freed by Jaime, and makes his way across the Narrow Sea. And this is where Bronn's path in the book and in the show diverges greatly. In the book, after learning that Bronn has named his wife's bastard son Tyrion, Cersei, assuming he did it to piss her off, conspires with Bronn's sister-in-law, Felice Stokeworth, and her husband, Balmain Birch, to kill Bronn. Cersei's plot fails like a motherfucker, and ends with Balmain being killed by Bronn, and Felice being banished from Stokeworth. In order to keep her hand to Bronn's assassination plot a secret, Cersei gives Felice over to Kyburn to be experimented on, and she dies as a result. After the death of Lawless's mother, Lady Tonda, Lawless becomes Lady Stokeworth, thus making Bronn her lord. Now that is the last we see of Bronn for the time being, and his role in the future isn't all that certain. However, in the show, as we know, Bronn's role is heavily extended. Rather than indulging in the whole Cersei trying to kill him plot, the writers have Bronn be recruited by Jaime Lannister to come with him to Dorne to retrieve Marcella in Season 5. He later works with Jaime again in Season 6, when Jaime seeks to settle the Siege of Riverrun. And in Season 7, we see Bronn is still working with Jaime as he commands the Lannister army though Bronn remains in King's Landing when Jaime sets off for Winterfell at the end of the season. Now while any sort of extension or revision of the source material has rarely been to the benefit of the show, I actually think the writer's decision to keep Ron in the show to a greater extent by having him buddy up with Jaime is one of their absolute best. For the show, Bronn basically ends up taking the place of Illyn Payne. In the book, it is Sir Illyn who trains with Jaime and later accompanies him to sell the Siege of Riverrun. Since Sir Illyn isn't the chattiest guy in the world, 
not really sure why, Jamie employs him in order to keep his sword training a secret, and uses him as sort of a human diary, indulging his more private thoughts to him. But having Bronn take his place only enhances the story tenfold, as the chemistry between Bronn and Jamie is just as entertaining as the chemistry between Bronn and Tyrion. As I said, Bronn's arc in the show is pretty damn solid, and thus I would probably leave it alone all the way up until the end of Season 7. The only changes we would have to make to Bronn's arc, as a result of the changes we have made thus far, are minimal. Per the Blackfishers episode, we are switching the Dorn and Riverrun storylines of Season 5 and 6 respectively, but this really doesn't affect his arc in any big way. So I am surprised as you are when I say that Bronn's arc all the way through Season 7 is pretty damn perfect, and I wouldn't change a thing. But then we get to Season 8 and... Hey man, that's not cool. So our problems start right away in Episode 1 of Season 8, when Kyburn approaches Bronn with an offer from Cersei to kill Tyrion and Jaime in exchange for a fuck ton of Benjamins. Now let's note the many, many problems in such a short scene. First, why would Cersei hire Bronn to kill Tyrion and Jaime? Cersei knows that Bronn has been the right-hand man for both of her brothers for the last several years now. Sure, he is technically a mercenary, but why choose a man who has so much history with them? Why not just hire a couple of no-names to take them out? Maybe she thought that Bronn would be able to get close to them without arousing suspicion, but then there is the whole matter as to why Bronn would trust Cersei at all. Per season 5, we learned from Jamie that Cersei was the one who axed his marriage to Lala Stokeworth, but in season 8, Kyburn tells Bronn that it was Jamie who did so. So I may have missed something, but I don't think we ever get any confirmation as to who cut off his marriage. I would assume it was Cersei, since she was Queen Regent come season 5, but again, it is never confirmed. But let's just say that Bronn believes Kyburn that it was Jamie who ruined his marriage arrangement. But why would Bronn trust Cersei to pay him for his services, even if he does end up killing the brothers? This is the same woman woman who just blew up half the damn city and has been ruling over it with an iron fist. Sure, he has been enjoying his time in King's Landing, but why would he trust her to keep her word? The best case scenario would be him killing Tyrion and Jaime, hitting Cersei up for his reward, and getting told to go fuck himself. And if he gave any lip, Cersei would just have Gregor split him in half, and not in the good way. It's even more nonsensical if you have read the books and know that Cersei tries to kill Bronn, and then later, after she fails, she kills the person whom she conspired with to carry out the hit which would be Bronn in the show's scenario. But whatever. I honestly think the writers didn't know what to do with Bronn once he was separated from both Tyrion and Jaime, and didn't want to just forget about him and have us assume he was just killed during the burning of King's Landing or fucked off somewhere before Danny and co rolled up. I mean, could you imagine if the writers just completely forgot about a particular character and never explained their ultimate fate, like not even in passing or with a throwaway line, they just acted like they never existed? That would be stupid. Anyway, I guess I can sort of buy that Cersei would send Bronn after Tyrion and Jaime just in case they survived a long night. Even if she thought he would never do that and turn on her, which is exactly what he did, at least there was always the slim chance that he would kill them. And maybe she, in her CBP paranoia, was even a bit wary that he may try to pull some shit if things started to go south once Danny rolled up at the front gates. Whatever, I suppose I can hand wave this scene. But then there is the scene where Bronn meets with Tyrion and Jaime, and this is right about the time that all logic and character development completely gets thrown out the window. So Bronn shows up and basically tells Tyrion and Jaime about Cersei's offer. However, he states that he basically knew the entire time that Cersei would eventually get her shit wrecked by Danny. So based on that, I presume he was planning on just chilling at King's Landing until Danny rolled up, and then he would have split. But then Kyburn gives him the offer to kill Tyrion and Jaime. Anyway, Bronn chastises both Tyrion and Jaime for not giving him what he is owed, given his loyal service to both of them throughout pretty much the entire series. However, instead of just showing up and being like, hey, I've done a lot for you two, and now that it seems pretty clear that we're going to win this thing, once King's Landing falls, I think I finally deserve my due, a request I am sure both Tyrion and Jaime would have obliged, since his services as a sellsword would no longer be needed, instead, he threatens to kill them. Again, keep in mind that he knows Cersei is fucked at this point, so he isn't threatening to kill them so Cersei can give him River Run. I mean, he does mention that if he kills Tyrion and a few of Danny's top peeps, maybe Cersei actually has a shot at coming out on top, which is laughably absurd given how much pwnage Danny ends up delivering upon her. So basically what Bronn is doing in this scene is saying, give me what I am owed or I will kill you. Again, we'll get to how this basically nerfs his character in a second, but let's stick with the logic of this situation. So after Tyrion offers him Highgarden, Bronn says that he will find them after they take King's Landing to reap his reward. Okay, so let me get this straight. Bronn threatens to kill Tyrion and Jaime if they don't give him what he wants. 
But what makes Braun think, if they were such dodgy, ungrateful fucks in the past, that they would keep their end of the deal? Let's say they take King's Landing and Braun shows up for Highgarden. What would entice Tyrion and Jaime to give it to him? Hell, wouldn't they just kill Braun to ensure their own safety? He did threaten to fucking kill them, right? So anyway, despite the completely fallacious logic displayed in this scene, the most egregious part of this whole scenario is how it basically revamps and recontextualizes Braun's entire relationship with the Lannister brothers, with complete disregard for his development throughout the series. Now you may be saying, wait, no it doesn't. Bronn has always been basically an employee of both Tyrion and Jaime. They weren't friends, he was simply a cutthroat for hire, as Jaime calls him in this scene. So it makes complete sense that he would eventually show up shit pissed that they never gave him his due, right? One of the things I love about Bronn's arc in the show is that it is far more subtle and more implicit than any other character. By that I mean Bronn's character arc is not demonstrated through huge dramatic events that lead to very clear and cemented plot beats, but rather must be implied through his behavior and interactions with the other characters. Even though Bronn and Tyrion's relationship throughout the first four seasons was technically an employer-employee one, there are a number of scenes that show that they seem to be forming a friendship, one that goes beyond monetary gain. Now of course Bronn wants money, the doy, but we also see that he and Tyrion seem to be buddying up. Perhaps this is simply due to the charisma of both Peter Dinklage and Jerome Flynn, and the writers having a bit of fun with their back and forth, which is filled with humor. But you can't just disregard that. This is cemented when Bronn comes to Tyrion after Tyrion is imprisoned following the Purple Wedding, which he also does in the book. So here's a question. If Bronn's relationship with Tyrion was strictly a financial one, why even show up? Why does Bronn meet with Tyrion and offer him an explanation as to why he won't be his champion. During the scene, it seems as if Bronn isn't totally dismissive or apathetic about Tyrion's predicament. He seems to be a bit remorseful about his refusal to fight for Tyrion. Again, we as an audience, and even Tyrion himself, don't blame him for it, but we can see he does feel a bit guilty about his decision. He even acknowledges himself as a friend of Tyrion's. But then in Season 8, after Tyrion flees King's Landing, Jaime, after telling Bronn that Cersei screwed over his marriage arrangement, promises Bronn a castle if he helps him in Dorne in Season 5, and again helps him settle the Siege of Riverrun in Season 6, and again helps him command the Lannister army against the newly arrived forces of Danny Targaryen in Season 7. It gets to the point where it basically becomes a running joke. I really think the writers just want Bronn and Jaime to buddy up, and Jaime's promise of a reward was just the rather flimsy justification to make it so. But despite what the writers want, wanted or wanted to imply, we have to take what is evident in the text at face value. And therefore, if Bronn was just tagging along with Jamie simply for the eventual financial gain, don't you think he would have either made Jamie pony up or would just stop working with him if it was made evident that Jamie was never going to give Bronn a castle? Surely Bronn, being a greedy cutthroat and all, wouldn't do all of this simply for the far off promise of a reward, right? What I am getting at is that, and again, I don't know if the show writers did this on purpose, I think given the text of the show, Bronn does go through some very subtle character development throughout the run of the series, with him starting out as just a run-of-the-mill sellsword, but eventually forming deeper and more meaningful relationships with those he associates with, Tyrion, Jaime, and hell even Podrick. He convinces Jaime to see Tyrion when he is imprisoned after the Purple Wedding, he trains with Podrick in Season 6, oh yeah, and then there was this. So, again, I think this may not have been intentional by the writers. Maybe they just wanted this kick-ass shot of Bronn saving Jaime from Drogon's fire because it was dope as hell. But I wonder if they realized what this seems to imply about Bronn's character. After Bronn and Jaime survived Danny's attack, Bronn tells Jaime that the only reason he saved him was because he needs Jaime alive so he can reap his reward. But does anyone really buy that if Bronn is meant to be portrayed as just a greedy cutthroat, he would do something like this simply for the prospect of financial gain? I saw Bronn's insistence that he save Jaime strictly to make sure he gets his payment as sort of part of a running joke. Bronn doesn't necessarily want to admit he saved Jaime because he actually sees him as a friend, so he just chalks it up to doing it for money. But the show wants to simultaneously have you believe Bronn is all about the Benjamins and will take out anyone who gets in his way, but also that he seems to have developed strong relationships with those around him when he doesn't need to, and pulled a risky-as-fuck YOLO charge in order to save Jaime's life. 
life. Even if you think there really isn't enough contextual evidence presented in the show to give the impression that Bronn has either changed over the course of the series or has remained the same old cutthroat he has always been, I'd argue the former is the more interesting and rewarding of the two. Having Bronn show up and threaten the lives of Tyrion and Jaime, the brothers he has been at the side of for literally the entire series, just seems off. It seems like the show tries to walk back on the developed relationships that they may have inadvertently had Bronn form with them both. Fuck, Jamie even says, Highgarden will never belong to a cutthroat. Dude, he saved your fucking life. Even if he did it for monetary gain, I still think he deserves a bit better treatment for this. Now there is a deleted scene from season 4 that features Bronn speaking with Shay after she is dismissed by Tyrion for her own protection, where he seems to speak ill of the upper class of King's Landing, including Tyrion, which could be communicating that he does feel some animosity towards the Lannisters. But this scene was of course left on the cutting room floor. Maybe the writers felt it didn't fit with Bronn's character, I can't say, but it was not included included in the show and thus we can't use it as contextual evidence. Even if it were in the show, you could argue he was just saying this shit to a piche and get her to fuck off. Anyway, that's enough about how I don't think Bronn's treatment in Season 8 was very fitting. So as I said, I would keep Bronn's arc all the way up through Season 7 intact. And hell, I'd even keep in Cersei asking Bronn to kill Tyrion and Jaime. So where are we going to diverge? Well, instead of having Bronn show up after the Long Night, we will have Bronn arrive towards the end of Episode 2, right on the eve of the battle. Could Bronn realistically travel from King's Landing to Winterfell between Episodes 1 and 2 in time for the battle? Well, why don't you ask Gendry? motherfucker. So Bronn will arrive at the walls of Winterfell just on the eve of the battle. Jaime has been released from his captivity by Danny in order to fight in the battle, and he and Tyrion greet Bronn at the front gates. Bronn tells the brothers of Cersei's offer, but says he has opted for Tyrion's deal of offering him double whatever he has offered to betray him. When Tyrion asks him why Bronn showed up before the battle and didn't wait until after, as he does in the show, Bronn says he knows Cersei would never pay up, so he has to make sure either Tyrion or Jaime survive so he can receive his payment, which of course will act as a callback to the same excuse he has used throughout the entire series. But in this instance, I think it would be nice if it is made clear that Bronn has, to some some extent, changed and is fighting for the side of the living, not just for the coin, but due to the friendships he has formed throughout the series. Maybe Tyrion or Jaime even calls him out on this, and he finally admits that he has actually grown to see the brothers as his friends. So Bronn will arrive before the battle begins, and will opt to be by Tyrion's side for the duration of the battle, as his personal bodyguard, just as he was in the beginning of the series. Side note, the crypt idea is fucking stupid. Instead of putting the women and children in the crypt, just put them in the library or the basement of the castle or something, I don't know, wherever there isn't a plethora of cadavers. Bruh. Now before we get to the long night and Bronze fate, I want to discuss how our rewrite for Bronn will not only rectify his treatment in Season 8, but will play a vital role in our rewrite for Tyrion. One of the most prominent questions and or notes I have received in regards to the series is regarding one of the biggest and most crucial plot points of this rewrite, and that is what eventually brings Tyrion back from the dark side and leads to him forsaking his previous bloodlust and killing Danny in the series finale in order to ensure peace for the Seven Kingdoms. As discussed at length, following him being accused of Joffrey's murder by his sister, being condemned by his father, having the city he risked everything to protect turn on him, watching his quasi-ally and his lover turn on him, and learning that his brother, the one person he truly loved in the world, lied to him about his first wife, thus resulting in him living his life thinking he would never be loved by anyone, Tyrion makes his way across the Narrow Sea to seek out Daenerys Targaryen in order to use her to take revenge against those who scorned him. Now as you can see, I think given the absolute clusterfuck of trauma and betrayal that Tyrion is objected to in Season 4, his heel turn from likable and charismatic Weisenheimer to bitter and jaded bloodlust filled son of a bitch is plausible if not completely warranted. Danny's heel turn at the end of Season 8 was not the issue most had with the show's conclusion. I mean, some thought her going CBP at all was uncalled for, but I think the majority of us show watchers could imagine a scenario where her heel turn could be plausible and or warranted. The problem was the utter lack of pacing and development of said heel turn. And some of you felt the same way about our rewrite having Tyrion all of a sudden having a change of heart by the end of the series, deciding to dispel his revenge-driven ways and eventually forsake and kill Danny. The catalyst for Tyrion snapping 
coming out of his bloodlust is of course the revelation that Cersei is in fact pregnant. After the meeting at the Dragon Pit and Cersei agreeing to aid the North in their battle against the Night King, Tyrion meets with her, demanding to know why she is all of a sudden being all cooperative and crap, which is where he ascertains that she is in fact pregnant. After learning this and having Cersei throw the deaths of both Tommen and Marcella in his face, Tyrion begins to have second thoughts about his master revenge scheme. But I would agree that this isn't sufficient enough to totally have the audience buy into him all of a sudden snapping out of his bloodlust, which is why we added in the scene in episode 2 where he meets with Jamie and they have it out. With Jamie apologizing for lying about Tysha and Tyrion understanding his brother's decision to keep the secret from him. There is also the death of Varys. He sees a man whom he once worked so close with and who seemed to trust and believe in him, killed due to his own actions. After the burning of King's Landing, and learning that both Cersei and Jaime have been killed, and believing that their unborn child was also killed in the process, I think putting all of this together, we can buy Tyrion snapping out of his bloodlust and deciding to repent for his past by killing Danny. But we could always use one more little tidbit to sweeten the deal. To add to the list of beats that Tyrion is given that makes his eventual turn back to the light plausible. So with all that said, let's get to our fate for Bronn. As stated, we will have Bronn arrive at Winterfell before the beginning of the battle, and shacking up with Tyrion in a secluded place in order to wait out the battle. Obviously, this doesn't go to plan, and their hideaway spot is overrun by walkers. Tyrion, Bronn, and the others are forced to fight to defend themselves from the undead horde. As in the show, it is soon apparent that they do not stand a chance against the army, and Tyrion awaits his death. As a white walker rushes toward him, about to end it all, Bronn steps in and defends his friend, but is mortally wounded in the process. Following the death of the Night King, Tyrion's life is spared, but unfortunately, it is too late for Bronn. Tyrion rushes to his friend's side, and they share a final conversation. Perhaps Bronn makes a crack about saving Tyrion's life twice now, or perhaps he says he owed him one for not fighting for him during his trial by combat back in Season 4. In any case, their final conversation will reveal and highlight that Bronn has truly cherished Tyrion's friendship over the years. Bronn's death as a result of saving Tyrion will serve as another brick in the wall, if you will, in causing Tyrion to forsake his revenge-driven ways by seeing a man whom he truly considered a friend sacrifice everything for him. Tyrion realizes that he truly did have someone in his life who cared for him, even if their friendship was mostly an unspoken one. I think this works as an additional character beat for Tyrion, supporting his decision to kill Danny in the finale, and acts as a fine culmination of Bronn's arc. A sellsword who believed in nothing and cared for no one through developing relationships with the most unlikely of individuals ends up deciding to fight for something other than just money and caring for those he considered his friends. And that is all for today's episode. As I said, not the most thorough or complicated rewrite, but I think it cleans up Bronn's arc and supports Tyrion's so hopefully you felt it worthwhile. Next up is, and I know I said I wasn't going to do it, and I'm not too happy about it, but fuck it, I guess it's too late to stop now, fucking Dorne. Originally, I wasn't going to even touch this shit, but after stepping back and taking a look at how the Dorne plot was handled in the show, I actually realized that there was a very simple and bleedingly obvious way the writers could have handled the arc that accomplishes the same goal, but without obliterating any and all logic or established characterization. But we will discuss that next time. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, consider supporting me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time.